What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in true crime. It is not a tagline. It is our way of life here, as guest number three is coming on right now. And there she is, Sarah Azari. We're going to get right into all of it in just a moment. But uh, as you can hear right now, the ticks of the clock are growing louder for Brian Koberger. He is, of course, the man accused of brutally stabbing to death four young University of Idaho college students. Uh, will he potentially receive the ultimate punishment, the death penalty? I know Sarah Azari says yes, because I saw one of her tweets. We'll find out why in just a little while. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Koberger was in court last Monday where he chose to, quote unquote, stand silent, something we don't see often. And uh, we will ask the panel about. Uh, so the judge, Judge Judge, by the way, I love that name, entered a not guilty plea for him. And a trial date is now set for October 2nd, 830 a.m. Of course, police do say that Brian Koberger is the 28 year old accused of these heinous crimes. But we want to remind everyone that he is presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Amazing best guest today. Dave Arenberg, the smile on his face is not because he's on the show, but because his Miami Heat came up big. Game seven there, he's got the Heat <laughs> mug or something right behind him. Uh, we are going to the finals. I actually bought myself the finals uh, shirt that they're wearing in the locker room so I can rub it in my kids' faces. But anyway, uh, he was elected to the Senate in 2002 as its youngest member here in Florida. He served for eight years. He's a graduate of a little school called Harvard Undergrad and Harvard Law. And uh, as I said, a proud South Florida sports team. You've got the Panthers doing great as well. Then you've got Sarah Azari. Glasses, no glasses, glasses, no glasses. She's a high-profile criminal defense attorney based in L.A. She has decades of experience defending complex felonies from investigation through trial in state and federal courts across the nation. She has been a media legal analyst across all platforms, from news to crime shows, none that she enjoys more than Surviving the Survivors. She told me that. She's <laughs> of her unbiased and informative legal point of view. As a matter of fact, she told me if Chris Cuomo called right now, she would say, I have to do Waldman show, not Chris Cuomo show. <laughs> she told me that before. Uh, Tara Malik is an Idaho licensed attorney practicing in state and federal court in business and commercial litigation. Uh, she also has experience in both civil and criminal law. She ran for state politics and is getting some advice from the great Dave Arenberg. And uh, who doesn't want to see Tara Malik uh, run for office in this country? A quick uh, programming uh, note here. Follow us on Facebook, Insta, Twitter. We are at Podcast STS. Patreon and YouTube uh, is available to you to support us. The merch store is open. Got a couple of requests for STS. I'm going to have to send one to Dave Arenberg so he can get a higher room rate or number uh, with my STS mug behind him. Um, oh, and by the way, these are about as good as you can get, guess wise. But tomorrow, not to outdo ourselves, we have Dr. Ann Burgess. The Netflix show Mindhunter is based on her original work uh, at the FBI. She testified in the original Menendez trials, mm -hmm. uh, the brothers trials, the original ones. Uh, and she will be on tomorrow with a guy named Dr. John Conte, who also testified. So we're getting original uh, witnesses from those first two trials. By the way, Dave, uh, before we get cracking on this, not to derail us right away, a uh, lot of chatter out there. You're a prosecutor. Should the Menendez brothers be released from prison? Um, coincidentally, I grew up playing tennis with those guys in New Jersey. Uh, they've been behind bars since 1989. Heinous, hideous crimes. But now there's new allegations of sexual assault. Uh, if you were prosecuting, would you uh, look for some sort of deal to let them out? No, they, they should uh, die in prison. They are despicable murderers. They murdered their parents as they were uh, eating ice cream in front of the TV, shooting from behind like the cowards, what? They, are, like the cowards they are. And, uh, and then when his mother was crawling away, the mother who did not, by the way, no allegation that they, that the mother engaged in inappropriate sexual misconduct against their kids as she was crawling away then they uh shot her multiple times to make sure she was she was dead and then they made the scene look like a mafia hit by shooting them in the kneecaps but it was such a bloody horrific scene that the cops knew it wasn't a mafia hit because the mafia doesn't do things like that they also don't clean up the kel the the, uh, sh the casings the 
of the, from the gun, from the bullets, like they did to try to hide their tracks. That's not what the mafia does. So no, no, Lyle and Eric should stay. Dave, in- Dave the mother was complicit. The mother did not protect her two sons. There's so much evidence about what the mother's part in all of this. But anyway, um, of course. I, you know. I just wanted Sarah and Dave to fight right out of the gates, and I succeeded. <laughs> so it's good. But anyway, the topic tonight is uh, Brian Koberger, and we'll shift back to that. Uh, as you all know, anytime we do a show uh, on uh, this case, I'd like to remember the uh, victims uh, lost way too soon. We've got Madison Mogan, 21, Kaylee Gonzalez, 21. Uh, Zana Kernodal, 20, and Ethan Chapin, 20. Uh, let's keep them in our thoughts uh, uh, as we go through this show. Um, so the state, by my count, uh, Sarah Zari, has about 50 days now. Uh, the, the, pra- the state has 60 days in total, about 50 right now, to decide about the death penalty. Uh, you say it is coming. Why? Well, I think it's coming because of the overwhelming evidence. And I say this with some reservation because, you know, there's a lot we don't know in this case. But um, just looking at the PCA, the probable cause affidavit, and some of this, uh, these requests for discovery, I'm glad, by the way, Tara's with us, um, a practicing Idaho attorney. I had to uh, study Rule 16. I wouldn't have studied it if I knew Tara was going to be on this, on this episode. <laughs> um, that took a little bit of time to prepare for you. But anyway, um, you know, the, the, uh, the evidence is overwhelming. And one of the, you know, one of the considerations for a prosecutor, I'm sure Dave would hopefully agree on this point, is that uh, the, the, the whether or how much lingering doubt there is, um, the more evidence there is that is compelling, um, the more likely the prosecution would seek the death penalty. And the considerations are very much the same as what the death penalty jury would, would hear, which is aggravating versus mitigating factors. You know, right now, uh, in all fairness, um, and I don't think that we've been very fair in the media to Brian Koberger in terms of his presumption of innocence, um, we don't really know anything about this guy besides, you know, why do you look at the camera like that? Why did he not speak? Or why? Well, if he spoke, why did he sound like that? I mean, anything this guy does or doesn't do, He's damned. So we don't know. We don't know anything that might be mitigating. Maybe there is nothing that's mitigating. And and mitigating also could mean about the circumstances of the uh, offense itself. So um, the prosecution right now, I think, is considering the overwhelming evidence, the aggravating factors, potential mitigating factors, and also possibly speaking behind closed doors to the defense about what the defense can bring in terms of mitigating factors to make that decision. But again, at very low percentage of cases, death penalty is sought. This is certainly one of them that that I think warrants the death penalty. And Tara, uh, you're all lawyers and uh, you speak in legal ease. But uh, when, when Sarah's talking about aggravating versus mitigating factors in Rule 16, uh, can you uh, translate that for us? What is what is aggravating versus mitigating mean? What is Rule 16 in Idaho? And, and do you think he's going to face uh, potentially the death penalty here? Um, well, I'll answer your last question first. Yes, I think he's potentially going to be facing the death penalty. I think it's a particularly egregious crime. I think it's pretty heinous what he did. We're not talking about one life that he took. We're talking about multiple young lives uh, in a really seemingly nonsensical way. You know, he's targeted and and it sounds like he's stalked these folks, uh, certainly drove past their house a number of times before the crime occurred. And so when we're talking, when Sarah's talking about aggravating and mitigating factors, the aggravating factors are the particular facts that make it heinous or egregious or really, really wrong. I mean, the things that kind of make you go, oh my gosh, um, you know, the planning portion of it, the the instrument that he used for the crime, uh, all of those things go into the aggravating factors here. Mitigating factors would be, you know, often you'll hear a defendant come in and talk about, you know, I'm a really good person. Here are all the great things that I've done in my life. And, you know, I was uh, any sort of reasons for, you know, the state that they were in at the time that they made these decisions or didn't. But in this case, I have a really hard time, uh, you know, even coming up with some explanation or some mitigating factor here that would that would warrant taking the death penalty off the table quite frankly well but but to to tara's point it's about his mental health too that that's what i was saying so a lot of times we see the defendant present evidence of 
you know, severe mental issues. I mean, some, sometimes it's not visible, right? We look at this guy, he looks pretty normal, might be, you know, psychotic, um, might be a sociopath or psychopath, but we don't really see mental illness um, visibly. So again, we don't, we just don't know what, what you might have nothing, you might have something, but I think it, to the extent anything exists, the, the, the defense is presenting it to the prosecution to get the death penalty off the table. And I have to say, not a large number, but I get enough emails and comments ahead of all these shows saying, look, you guys are already convicting this guy uh, in the court of public opinion. Uh, this is kind of uh, the American way where you uh, can talk freely about cases. But uh, obviously, I said off the top, uh, and Dave Arenberg knows this better than anyone else, there needs to be a presumption of innocent. We'll see what happens in the courtroom. But uh, Dave Arenberg, to you. Uh, there is a prosecutor, well-known, always on TV, former prosecutor named Matt Murphy. Um, mm -hmm. He came out uh, in the same Newsweek article that Sarah Azari is, uh, her tweet is quoted in, by the way, Sarah. I don't even know if you know that, but you're- Really? Yes. Oh, look oh. at that. I'm breaking news. Sarah Azari's tweet <laughs> is in a big Newsweek article that just came out a day or two ago. And okay. I'll read you your, I'll read you your tweet, Sarah Azari. Okay. But first I'll read Dave Arenberg, uh, the quote, from Matt Murphy. He says, a prosecutor under these circumstances will weigh the aggravating, there we go again, versus mitigating circumstances. It's essentially the same job that a jury will be asked to do, which is the question here, who's gonna decide death, uh, the jury, the judge, it is, I assume the, the jury here. Yes. Uh, this case is so overwhelmingly awful, for lack of a better term, I think there's gonna be a lot of pressure within the DA's office to actually seek the death penalty. Um, Dave, do you agree with that? And do me a favor, take us behind the scenes uh, into the uh, you know, state attorney's office. What is going on behind closed doors? Yeah, they're going to seek the death penalty here. And you know when A-list criminal defense lawyer Sarah Azari says he agrees with the death penalty, you know that the prosecutors in Idaho, as well as their prosecutor, will agree to that as well. Look, I, I, Tara explained uh, Rule 16, and I assume that uh, the Idaho rules are similar to our rules in Florida. See, what would happen here in Florida is that we would judge the aggravators and the mitigators. And the benefit for the defense is that there's no limitation on mitigators. The defense can put up anything they want. His mother didn't love him enough, but prosecutors have to have a, a specific uh, aggravators like was it heinous, atrocious, and cruel? That's an aggravator in Florida. Uh, was it done uh, in a cold, calculated, and premeditated way? Were there multiple victims? These are certain criteria, and you look at the criteria on the aggravator side, and you judge it against the unlimited mitigators on the other side. And as Sarah said, mental health is a big thing. You'll hear from defense bar, the uh, public defender, if that's the lawyer, they'll send us a letter saying, look, here is a analysis of this defendant by his psychiatrist that said he is bonkers. And so, you know, it is unconstitutional to execute someone who is mentally, uh, depending on the level of mental illness. But so we, we have to judge that and decide whether we're going to seek it. And then you have to say, can we get it? Can we get a unanimous jury? Remember in Parkland, you had the worst case, 17 innocents slaughtered by this awful, evil individual. And the jury there said, "Now nah, we're not going to uh, give him the death penalty for it. And so you have to decide, can we get it? That's the decision we make. And then it's up to the jury. So well, Dave, are, don't you as a prosecutor also, because the death penalty case is also a lot more work for the prosecution and also in the consideration of what the jury might do. Um, uh, I mean, doesn't that also impact um, getting a death qualified jury that is able to follow the law uh, I mean, this is a bifurcated trial. There's the guilt phase and then the penalty phase. And you want to make sure that your jury is able to, it's a whole other level of following the law when it comes to um, deciding the death penalty. So I think there's all those considerations too, in addition to, you know, what you normally look at in a case, like whether you're deciding to file charges, you know? That's true. Also, there is an advantage for prosecutors. We don't like to talk about it too much, but there's an advantage if you seek mm -hmm. the death penalty. In that, then you have to do what Sarah, Sarah just said, which is to qualify the, the jury. They have to be death penalty qualified, which means that the jurors during jury selection have to be asked whether they feel comfortable imposing the death penalty mm -hmm. on a human being. Well, mm -hmm. 
when you get jurors who feel comfortable doing that, that's generally more conservative jury pool. It's better for prosecutors. And so that's a plus. On the other hand, it does complicate things. It, it costs a lot more. It slows things down. And yeah, and so these are all the considerations. Uh, the final thing is, 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 the one final thing is this. In a case like Idaho or Parkland, if you don't seek the death penalty in those cases, when? When do you ever seek it again? Yeah, and Dave, mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, just going back to Parkland for a minute, because I, I was back in local news for a bit in Miami, and I was talking again to Fred Guttenberg, who I'm sure you know, and Manuel Oliver, uh, both fathers. What, what happened there? Because that is a case. If that guy did not get the death penalty, like you just said, who in the world ever will get it? Well, there were uh, there's women on the jury who saw this this kid who was dressed like a child. They infantilized him. Is that the have infantilized infantilized him with the sweater and the oversized glasses, the Menendez brother sweater he's wearing, and then the oversized <laughs> glasses. And and after being with him in the same room, sitting so close to him for for several weeks, months, there were three jurors who just could not agree to kill him, mm -hmm. and that was. One one more thing, if I may add, um, the death penalty cases also face much more appellate scrutiny. Um, that's another consideration I think that someone like Dave would you know would make uh, before seeking it. But again, I'm not saying I definitely think it'll be sought here. But uh, but that's another another thing to consider. And Rule 16 has to do with discovery. I'm sorry, I threw it in there in terms of in the in the context of um the death penalty but has to do with discovery and i was like well thank god tara's here because she can correct me <laughs> yes <laughs> one more thing but, if i can add in, and janice is i'm sorry tara just one more thing janice is on the screen yes i was going to bring this up families matter the victims matter yes. and so if the victims say no we don't believe in it we don't want it then prosecutors are much less likely to seek it every prosecutor's office is different though uh, when I took over here, I brought back a committee. I have a committee that recommends me whether or not to seek the death penalty. But ultimately, it's my decision. Ultimately, it's a state attorney, district attorney's decision to seek or not seek. By well, the way, I mean, here, here there's a lot of pressure by the families. They want the death penalty, right? So, And that matters. Yeah. I, I don't want to create any more division, but uh, SDS Nation, weigh in on the Arenberg versus Azari backgrounds. Uh, my vote is for Azari, um, but please let me know. Um, what you think? Although the Miami Heat, that, that cup's pretty awesome. Um, it's a it's a sticker. I had a I paid like eleven bucks on Amazon. I can't believe someone's making money on this. I'll, I'll chip in, Dave. We'll get a GoFundMe for you to get you a, an actual Miami Heat uh, coffee thing. Um, Tara Malik, to you uh, from Laura Waldy. Uh, the victims' families, to Dave's point, they're going to want the death penalty. How much weight do they have in the ultimate decision? And how about Koberger's family? Do they listen to uh, the suspect's family at all? I, I would assume probably not. And ultimately, I think the discretion is with the state, right? Right, Tara? Yeah, I mean, it's Dave said it accurately. I mean, it, it is the prosecutor's decision on whether or not to ultimately seek the death penalty. And, and there's a difference between, um, you know, what a, and with all due respect to every victim's family. You know, these are awful, awful crimes. But there is a difference between wanting to seek the death penalty and then being able to prove up those aggravating factors and making that a reality. Those are two very different things. And and so, and I'm sure um, Dave has done this with families. I know I you know, certainly have, you have to sit them down and kind of tell them the reality of the situation and say, you know, I hear you. And we're going to, we're going to do two, you know, segments of our conversation here. I want to hear all of it, you know, give me all of it, all of your thoughts, all of your feelings. And then we're going to go into a space too. And I'm going to tell you what we can and can't accomplish given what the law says. And so, you know, those are hard conversations to have. And so it's not that their opinion doesn't matter or it doesn't count. And certainly you're going to take it into consideration, but you only have, you can't make up facts. The facts are the facts and the law is the law. And you can only work with what you have there. And you've got to talk about, you know, what the probability is. And, um, you know, Sarah is exactly right. If these cases will go up on appeal, inevitably, uh, it's not like they get sentenced to death and then next year they're going to be put to death. I mean, these go on for years and years. And so from a, even from a cost perspective to the state, it is a 
ton of time and cost and, um, you know, time for both the, the defense side and the prosecution side. And in some ways, um, you know, I, I think that it is disappointing to families, even if there is a death penalty sentence, because it's not immediate. You don't get that immediate closure of like, it's ending today. It's an ongoing kind of drama and saga with every post-conviction motion, with every appeal issue that goes up. So, um, you know, I think that is oftentimes forgotten is that it's a really long path to even if death penalty um, is successful, if, if he is sentenced to death, it's a really long path to get there. You know, Tara, Tara, if I just may, she hit on something that I think might be interesting for your viewers is this idea of, um, I, I mean, I, I consider um, the idea that I have to handhold and really sort of, I mean, it's, it's very difficult for a defense attorney to tell their client they're never going to see the light of day, let alone they're going to be on you know, death row. Um, but the, the, the conversations that a prosecutor has with victims is probably, you know, the, the, the most challenging part of your job in terms of that management of feelings and expectations um, that we deal with a lot, obviously, because we're dealing with the defendant. But, you know, victims, in my experience, forget about, you know, murders and heinous crimes, but even victims of fraud, I mean, they come in and sometimes their expectations are not at all uh, realistic, you know, they want life without parole because the guy stole a million dollars. I'm like, you're not, you know, I'm sorry, you're not gonna get that, you know. So victims are are often, um, you know, not satisfied with what the outcome is. But at least, you know, in a, in a death penalty case, you want to make sure that it's gonna stick because you you also don't want the victims to go through this, like Tara explained, this roller coaster of appellate decisions and you know and and things that go on for years and years. So. Anyway, I, I think the client management part's interesting because people don't see that, you know, in our jobs. Yeah, uh, Dave, I, I get fixated on the minutia. I mean, God forbid this case was in your county. Um, how would that shift your uh, your workflow? I mean, how much time would you be spending on a case like this? We can accommodate it because we have a homicide division, and this is what they're good at, and we have capital cases. Um, too often here. I mean, and we will seek the death penalty in certain cases. But after the uh, state of Florida made it harder to get the death penalty, we uh, we sought it in fewer cases, knowing that we would never get it. In like, for example, we had that clown killer case as a cold case. Originally, I sought the death penalty in that case. That was my decision. And then um, after, you know, we looked at a little more closely the evidence, and uh, passions cooled a little bit, and. Uh, was, we had some witness issues. We realized we're not going to get the death penalty against a uh, 60 something year old woman who otherwise had never committed another crime uh, in her life. And so we're uh, we, we decide not to. And so these we, we do what you would think we do. You know, we have to make the best decision we can with the facts and circumstances in front of us. And there's a time limit. You got to do it up front at, within a certain period of time or else you lose that chance. So sometimes you'll seek it and then pull it back and say, no, take it off the table later. And Dave, but what are the stats? What are the murder stats in West Palm Beach? Uh, I don't have them in front of me, but uh, <laughs> one a are, year, one a year. No, oh no, 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 no. no, no. It gets we have more than that here. Yeah, really? no, no, it gets uh, it, I, I worked in West Palm Beach, um, in that you know, in, in uh, in the western part of the county, it gets uh, starts getting a little hairy. Well, mm -hmm. uh, well, well uh, what Sarah is referring to is probably Palm Beach. Palm Beach, yeah. the island, the exclusive island there. There are no murders there. Uh, in uh, well, the Palm county. Beach is where Mar-a-Lago is, right? Right. Correct. Correct. Uh, oh, got it. So uh, West Palm Beach is not, okay. Got it. I'm sorry. So West Palm wrong. Beach is the county seat. That's where I am. That's the city. There, there are some patches where there, there we do have some some violence, and where we uh, work on that, but. And then um, I'm the state attorney for the entire county. That includes Boca Raton and Jupiter and, and places right. out west that uh, Joel was referring to. So, yeah, so there is crime. And like any other big area where you have about almost two million people, you're going to have some violent crime. Right. And then uh, when you move into the uh, world of the wealthy, like the Jeffrey Epstein's, you get into other sorts of crime. But I'll reserve that for another time. Uh, Cindy, C Cindy Woodburn, um, back to you, Brian. Uh <laughs> Dave, not Brian. Uh, will Brian's father be called to testify, Dave? Uh, I would have paid good money to hear their conversation on the way home. Um, you know, I asked some law enforcement officials and actually former FBI, because he was stopped twice in Indiana. Uh, they say across the board that was 
on purpose, done by the FBI. I don't care what the FBI is saying publicly. Uh, do you believe those stops were done on purpose? And I'll get into some of the evidence uh, that came out in this Dateline episode in a little while. Um, but was that coincidence? And, and what about this question here? Will he be um, asked to give testimony at this trial? You know, I, I don't know that first answer. I'd be interesting, interested in hearing the panel on this one because I go back and forth. I mean, those were local state troopers, and they had a legitimate reason to pull them over. These guys committed traffic violations. And I don't know if they were just pulling them over just to pull them over because of this larger investigation. Uh, but there's no doubt that they were tracking them overall. Like they, Law enforcement had eyes on these folks for a while. I do think that the father will uh, show up in some way in, in the courtroom, uh, excuse me, on the witness stand, because there is no parent-child privilege, unlike spousal privilege. So he can't conceal conversations that he had with his son. He can always take the Fifth Amendment for himself, but not for his son. So I do think that he probably has some evidence that'd be relevant, so he'll be called as a witness. I mean, uh, certainly if there's the death penalty, um, I would think he would be testifying on Brian's behalf, right? In the death penalty phase. That's the penalty phase, right. But you think in the evidentiary phase, the, the trial yeah. phase. Yeah. yeah. By the way, Dave Ehrenberg, Shaquille Oatmeal, uh, asking people to hit the like button. I'm convinced this is the real Shaq who comes on uh, incognito to throw us all off. But um, I'm going to consider it the real guy. Uh, and by the way, people are asking him if he turns down any sponsorship deals. He uh, he took the fifth on that one. Uh, Sarah Zari, your tweet in Newsweek uh, read, uh, this crime was certainly heinous enough to support pursuit of the death penalty, which is about mitigating versus aggravating factors, in case you were wondering. But um, the trial is now set for uh, October 2nd, um, 8.30 a.m. in the morning, um, mm -hmm. Lataw County. Is there any way that this trial actually starts then, uh, especially if they pursue the death penalty? Yeah, I, I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I, you know, I, I was thinking about when, when I was thinking about this podcast, you know, what's the state's case? What's the defense? Case? I mean, we just don't know enough. Right. We know it's bad. Uh, we can imagine the abundance of evidence there is because of just like the terabyte size or whatever that the prosecution produced. But it's not always about the quantity. It's also about the quality. Um, and so I don't even really know what this case looks like to then be able to say what the defense would be like. Um, but I think, uh, you know, one of the things, and I know we're going to get to this idea that he stood silent, you know, instead of entering a not guilty, instead let the judge do that. To me, signals sometimes that when we think that there's even a possibility that he would ultimately plead guilty, maybe if, if the prosecution agrees to take the death penalty off the table in order for him to, you know, plead guilty, whatever that might be, that deal might look like, you know, we don't want in a quadruple murder case, our client to stand up there, uh, you know, stone faced saying not guilty. I mean, that's not a good look, you know? And so I always thought maybe that that might be why, because even though it's not unusual to stand silent, uh, it is it, it is also not extraordinary. I mean, that is an option. Um, typically we see guilty or not guilty. Typically we see not guilty more than guilty, but this was just, uh, to me, might signal why his lawyers may have counseled him to stand silent. And also because anything this guy has done has been spun and spewed and just gone down this rabbit hole of what a psychopath he is because he did say this or didn't say that or whatnot. So anyway, back to your point. My point is, is that it's possible. It's possible. I mean, certainly if, if he, uh, if, if they seek the death penalty and they're willing to take it off the table, it would be because he would strike a deal with the, with the prosecution, which would mean he would go down on life without parole on all four counts. And then we don't see the trial go forward. Um, and I, and I also believe, you know, Dave hopefully agrees with me is that, that I think if there is a trial, it ain't going to be this year. There's no way. So it'll get moved anyway. Dave, do you agree with that? Yeah, in general, these death penalty cases, especially with multiple victims, uh, take longer than a uh, regular trial, and they do get postponed. I, I would be surprised if defense didn't seek a continuance at some point. So, yeah, I agree mm -hmm. with Sarah. Yeah. Um, Adam Blue, fire weighing in from, I believe he's in Barcelona. Uh, Brian Koberger will probably end up giving evidence in his trial, but do you think he will come across 
as extremely unlikable to a jury. Tara, I mean, we've seen him in the courtroom a couple of times. Um, you know, he's described as kind of bizarre, but people do read a tremendous amount into every facial movement, uh, every movement he makes. Um, but w what are your thoughts early on? Will a jury be unsympathetic to him because he comes across a little, a little hollow, for lack of a better adjective? Well, we don't know yet. We haven't really seen him say a lot in court. You know, he said yeses um, to understanding the charges against him. Certainly there's been a lot of press coverage. And as both um, uh, Sarah and Dave have pointed out, you know, you're going to we're going to be reading into every everything he says, everything he does, all his body language. Um, I would say that the jury is going to be watching him really closely. As soon as he walks into that courtroom, all eyes are going to be on him. Uh, as he's sitting at counsel's table, they're going to be analyzing anything he's doing, saying, writing, all of it. Um, you know, if he's as much of a um, loner and kind of social outcast as has been kind of portrayed by people who've known him or crossed paths with him, yeah, he could stick out if he does end up taking the stand, which is a really really big if, um, you know, that could be off-putting to a jury if he's not able to relate, you know, to people in the ways that we would expect people to relate to, you know, to um, show some sort of humanity, something outside of that kind of cold exterior that so far people have been speculating about. Uh, that will definitely not be working in his favor at all. Uh, Dave, this is obviously a very uh, sensitive uh, line we're about to not cross, but I, I think it's important to address. So uh, the two surviving victims um, obviously are being heavily scrutinized, uh, especially in the court of public opinion. Kareen Cole is asking a question a lot of people are asking. Uh, why is it a crime not to call police when a murder happens and the two survivors haven't been charged? They call their sorority sisters and the crime scene was full of people destroying evidence. Um, is this something that you as a prosecutor would have to look at, um, you know, regardless of the fear of victim shaming or whatever else might come your way? Um, before you answer that, though, coming in hot, 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 Dave. Wow. <laughs> three, three of them. Three of them. Dara is already just nice. waving that off. But um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, Dave Arenberg, I, I agree with Tiffany, by the way, but uh. Yeah, so I mean, on a serious note, uh, back to Corinna's comment here. Uh, what, what what do you make of this? Well, it's not a crime uh, unless you have a duty to report. So, like a police officer who didn't run into the building, that would be a potential crime. Scott Peterson uh, is on trial this week in Broward County for not running into the Parkland uh, school, the high school where the murders happen. There's a duty because he's a police officer. But if you're a civilian, if you're a victim, no, you don't have their, uh, a criminal uh, requirement, a requirement under the law to call police right away. And people act differently when they experience severe trauma. So as a prosecutor, you'd want to work with the witnesses to get the story and to be able to explain it because when they take the stand, and this is different than Brian Koberger. I'm not sure Koberger is taking the stand, but these witnesses will take the stand because they were there and they will be cross-examined and all this stuff will come up and you don't want to give any jurors any reasonable doubt. So you want to know what happened. And if it's because of trauma, yeah, you want to bring that out. And then you may want to have a, uh, an expert witness to talk about what happens when people undergo uh, amounts of trauma that maybe they just go back to sleep and pretend it never occurred rather than, you know, go and call 911 immediately. So, you know, different people act in different ways and there is no requirement under the law for someone to call police as soon as they see a crime occurring. That that's a fair, I think that's a fair explanation that a jury may, you know, may be persuaded by. But what there's another layer to this that, that's related to, to what you just addressed, Dave, which is in that in that span of time of eight hours, there was evidence that potentially could have been tampered with, destroyed. There's, you know, again, a lot of it is speculative in this case, but there's reports about potential drugs and things that were in the house that were cleaned up before law enforcement was called to the scene. So you betcha that the defense is going to essentially focus on a shoddy investigation, evidence tampering, evidence destruction, because of such an extensive amount of time that went by before law enforcement was called to the scene. That's not necessarily the same issue, but it's the same amount of time that we're talking about. Um, and I think that's one of the things I see that 
yeah, even though I don't know all what the evidence it really looks like right now, I think that's something that I do know the defense is going to hang its hat on if this goes to trial. Uh, Tara, you were uh, in law school most recently. Um, so from Yuri here, uh, would you please clarify the difference between a defendant's constitutional entitlement to presumption of innocence versus misconce misconceptions about innocent till proven guilty? Um getting into the weeds here, but uh, is there something to be discerned there and differentiated? I'm not sure what misconceptions about innocent till proven guilty, but but here's here's how I would explain it. You know, when, when someone walks into the into a courtroom, when someone's accused of a crime, it's an accusation only. We assume until a judge or a jury deems them guilty that they are innocent. So what does that mean? The practical effect is that the state has the ultimate burden here. They need to prove up each and every element of the crime that they've charged against um, Koberger. So, uh, and they have to do it not just you know, on, on whatever standard, they have to do it beyond reasonable doubt, which is not all doubt, but reasonable doubt. And so it is a very heavy burden. And if it goes into a part two, because this will be a bifurcated trial with a second phase, that's the death penalty portion of it. They're going to have to do the same thing with those aggravating factors. They're going to have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. So um, when we talk about uh, innocent until proven guilty or the presumption of innocence, what we're really saying is that when you walk in there, just because you're in handcuffs or just because you've been charged with a crime, uh, we are assuming that you're innocent and the state has to prove it all up and they have to convince all those jurors that this is what occurred. Um, Dave, I know uh, Dave is not just any attorney. He's the uh, state attorney in Palm Beach County, so he's going to have to roll in a little bit. But uh, before you go, Dave, this whole uh, standing silent in the courtroom last Monday and Bremner, who we have on the show um, and was a prosecuting attorney in, in uh, Seattle for many years, she says, as I understand it, he's pretty obsessed with his own coverage. So he's going to make a statement by being silent and he's going to watch that, too, she said. He's getting his Ph.D. I don't think he had gotten it yet, but he obviously knows a lot about criminology and he's probably over lawyering more than he thinks uh, his lawyer and he probably thinks it's some kind of strategy. What did you make of him standing silent? Had you seen that before? And was it some kind of weird ploy? Yeah, it happens. Uh, we saw in a recent high profile case. Uh, was it Murdoch? I forgot. Uh, no, not that one. There was another one recently we saw it. So it, it does happen. But on this one, I want to give uh, props to Sarah because she uh, pushed back against a lot of people who thought the the way that that last person did. And, and I agree with her on this one. And that is that I think it was, yes, this was an attempt uh, to make sure that the, uh, the plea negotiations were open. And because you want to not piss off the victim's families anymore by standing up there and saying, not guilty. Yeah. As well as the prosecutors, by the way, who were snickering when, you know, not guilty. Like, yeah, what a liar. But the fact that he said nothing, I think shows perhaps like maybe they're trying to show a little bit of remorse and humility that he will accept life in prison and hope the victim's families accept that in exchange for taking the death penalty off the table. And by the way, that doesn't change anything because it's still a not guilty plea, except the judge entered it for him instead of him uttering it. It's the utterance that would have really kind of, I think it would have, it would have been very distasteful in my opinion. And also, I think that if I were his lawyer, I would probably, um, you know, advise him the same in that, you know, the last thing I want to do is feed this frenzy of this Koberger frenzy of like, whatever he does is something nefarious, you know, it gets spun into something nefarious. So the less I could put out there, um, you know, with cameras on him, the, the better the better for my client. You know? And Sarah, how would you, before you walked into that courtroom last Monday, what do you advise him to, in terms of how to act, how to behave? Um, I would tell him to, uh, first of all, not to speak up. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times, you know, and, and I didn't get that impression like he's trying to control his defense because typically that personality um, blurts out something stupid. You know, and so I didn't see that from him. I thought he was very compliant. 
Um, I, I would really say to do exactly what he did. Keep his head down, be respectful. Don't start talking. If he has anything to say, if he has any questions to ask me. Um, so I really, honestly, not, it was nothing unusual to me. And I think it was good strategy on the part of his lawyers, given that the possibility of him pleading is there. By the so way, there's did, one other. Did, yeah, go ahead. Sorry about that. One other point on the standing silent. There, there is right now a pending motion to compel by the defense against the prosecution. And what they're saying is, hey, uh, judge, the the state hasn't turned over everything that they have. And that's critical to our case. And that is still that hasn't gone to hearing yet. Mm -hmm. So I think another um, aspect of the standing silent could be uh, in support of this argument that they're going to make. I mean, if I'm an attorney and I don't think that I have all the evidence that I need to even properly advise my client, that might be another reason for the standing silent is that I don't I don't have it yet. And I've got this pending motion out there um, as well. But you know, Ann Taylor is an attorney that I know that I've worked on the other side of. Um, she has great client control uh, mm -hmm. and she's a really, really experienced attorney. She's very good at what she does. Uh, I don't think there's anything, you know, I, I, I would be shocked if Brian was, you know, steering this ship without her right. advice and guidance. And also, uh, Tara, you know, even if they did have everything they needed and there was, you know, there was no issues of discovery outstanding. I mean, you don't strike a plea deal on a quadruple murder with right. potential death penalty like that quickly. So, they, right. you know, you still would have to plead not guilty or some some not guilty would be mm -hmm. entered for him so that he has an opportunity to Absolutely. work out that plea deal. So I, I, again, I think it was completely normal, but it was fodder for all the uh, spin masters out there. Uh, Dave, I know you have to get going. Last thing for you here. Um, you're more than welcome to stay. I just, I always get nervous when uh, time goes too long with you, but Patrick Bain says, uh, and, and he's been making some comments, which a lot of people do. Uh, and this is being asked, I think uh, with some cynicism, they can execute someone for an alleged offense. Uh, People say, hey, uh, you're convicting this guy already. Uh, Dave Ehrenberg, what do you say to these people? Yeah, after he's found guilty in a court of law by a unanimous jury beyond any reasonable doubt, then it would go to a second uh, part of the trial, the penalty phase, where again, the jury will be asked beyond any reasonable doubt, but unanimously, if the aggravators overcome all the mitigators and he's, he should get the death penalty. So. Yeah. After all that, yes, then you can execute someone. And then, of course, will be caught up in appeal after appeal through the state and the federal system, habeas. And yeah. maybe years later, he can finally be executed. So it's not so easy. Just We just execute someone based on an allegation. There's so <laughs> many more steps that have to uh, happen. Also, Patrick Bur uh, Baines, is that uh, a pseudonym for the guy from the Talking Heads? It probably is. is we'll Patrick find out. Burns for the Talking Heads? I think it might be Burns. I have to look that. I'll Google that for All you, right. Dave Ehrenberg. Uh, final thing. Will, will there be a change of venue, Dave? Oh, uh, well, right now it's in uh, it's in, it's in Moscow. Uh, Latah County. Right, yeah. right. That's probably a better question for Tara, I would think. I think that they could, like my experience is, you can find an impartial jury um, on any case, no matter how high profile, because it's not a question of whether you've heard about the case. You're allowed to come in there with some knowledge about the case as long as you can set aside your biases and just follow the evidence in the law. If you can get jurors to say they will do that, yeah, then you can go ahead with it. So I, I don't know. I mean, like they moved the Vallow case to Boise. They could do the same thing here, but I think you can find an impartial jury. But I'll let the Idaho expert uh, give her opinion on that. Okay. Uh, Tara? Uh, in Moscow is a real small community. Um, and, and Dave has a good point. You're right. You know, it's not about what you hear about the case. It's whether you can put that all aside and listen and weigh um, the evidence as it comes in. Um, you know, I, I think, though, that Lataw County in Moscow in particular is such a small county that there it wouldn't surprise me if there was a motion for change of venue. And in fact, um, you know, if I was representing Koberger, I would probably advise to do a motion to change venue, especially in this type of case. But it's going to be hard to find, you know, a jury that hasn't heard anything about this case, you know, statewide. Uh, it's very well publicized. I mean, it's publicized on a national level. People have been following it. Uh, so, you know, it, it's these types of cases, I think, are a particularly uphill battle um, for the defense in that regard. 
Well, wait a second, though. I, okay, so I disagree. Jurors are human beings. They can come in and say, oh, yeah, I've, I've heard about it, but I can be, you know, fair and impartial. I mean, look at what happened to Murdoch. You know, Murdoch, they tried to change venue. They, they went around to different counties around Culleton County. And, and ultimately, when they were picking a jury, they let go of at least 300 people that not only had heard about it, but had formed opinions about it. And then the idea of what's so dangerous, I just spoke about this on, on News Nation yesterday, the, the dangerousness of, of you know, the role that media plays, um, not SDS, okay, because you're legit, but the role that media plays um, and sleuths and you know, documentaries in, in, in putting out information that may not always be accurate, that might be rumor, that might be misinformation, that is so incredibly dangerous because if you start talking to jury consultants, they tell you that it's not about then presenting what is accurate to that jury and then them promising you that they're only going to focus on that because it, it, you just can't undo that. It's, it's a bell that once it's rung, you can't unring. And that's what's really dangerous in as much as we're using media to solve cold cases and go after missing people and find them and bring them home safe. We're also in this, you know, true crime genre that is incredibly dangerous to the presumption of innocence and a right to fair trial. Um, so there might be a podcast coming soon in that regard, but I'm going to shut my mouth right now. <laughs> but Sarah, that could go both ways, right? I mean, because I've, I've certainly had, as a former prosecutor, I've had cases, I'm, I'm sure Dave has too, where you get someone on that jury who just hates cops. They hate the government. They hate cops. Sure. They hate, you know, they hate the whole thing. And they, and they'll say, so they'll sit there and be like, no, it's okay. You know, I had all these 10 bad experiences and I kind of hate them, but you know, it, it's not enough there to kick them off for a cause. You're, you don't have enough, yeah. pre, you know, preemptory strikes to get them off there and they stay on there. And while they've told the judge, yeah, I can be fair and impartial, they do the same thing. And yeah. they're kind of a sleeper agent there, you know, but and you, you come won't back. Have and no have problem because they'll look at you and Dave and be like, but she's cute, but he's cute. So <laughs> I'll, ask, I'll let it slide. <laughs> hey, Tara, um, from Dom's uh, mom. Go Joe, ahead, Dave. I've got to take up, but I want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you for having me on. Dave, it was great to be with you again. Great Good to, to be see with you, you. And, and Tara, great to see you. Joel, uh, last thing it was David Burns, not Patrick Burns on Talking Heads. My oh. mistake. Oh. Okay, so it's not he's not here, but Shaquille O'Neal is here. I'm convinced. So we've got <laughs> one out of two. Dave, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Go Heat, baby. Go Heat. Go Panthers. <laughs> Love it. See you later. Um, we're gonna have these two uh, powerful women stay on for a little bit longer. So, uh, Sarah, I don't think I've gotten your take on this. I know Dave is very pro transparency, but. Uh, mm -hmm. June 9th, there's going to be another hearing about this uh, media gag order. Mm -hmm. um, the judge came down kind of hard on uh, the AP Media right. Coalition, mm -hmm. uh, telling them to tone it down in their challenge mm -hmm. to the gag mm -hmm. order. He obviously uh, wants to control the, the his courtroom. Should there be media and a camera in that courtroom? Well, look, I always find, I mean, from a selfish standpoint, I, I want to see the trial for myself. I don't want to just rely on reporters that are in the courtroom that may not be lawyers. The issues that sometimes come out are non-issues or things that are issues don't get reported. So I really want to, you know, a lot of people also inquiring minds want to see and observe and, and hear for themselves. But where there's a gag order, it, it's about the, um, the tension between defendant's Sixth Amendment right to fair trial and the First Amendment right to free speech. And so essentially the judge signaled, like you said, to AP, like, whoa, I don't think you're fairly uh, arguing this tension between these two constitutional rights. And you're really looking at it from just the First Amendment perspective or lens. Um, but we also need to protect the right to fair trial, because by the way, that is not just in the interest of the defendant. It's all the way in, it's also in the interest of the state because nobody wants to go through the appellate process, you know, on a wrongful conviction or something. So, you know, this gag order, if I were to read the tea leaves, I think it will remain in place with respect to media, uh, maybe a slight modification, but it's certainly not going to get lifted. And I think it'll be more clarified with respect to the families, like the Gonsalves family, who've also filed their own petition and want to want to be able to go give interviews, this should have never applied to them. The initial order by the magistrate judge was that it would be applicable to parties, and they are not parties. Victims are not parties. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Tara from uh, Dom's mom, uh, if they put it through for the death penalty and the jury agrees he's guilty, but they don't want to impose a death penalty, what happens? Are, are there there are basically two trials, right? First to convict. Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, so it's a bifurcated trial. So the first part will be whether he's guilty of the crimes that are um, charged against him. And then um, once the jury comes back on that, then they go into phase two where they get a second set of instructions. Uh, and there are the mitigating and aggravating factors we've talked about that have to be presented. Um, if the jury comes back and says and they don't find um in favor of the death penalty beyond a reasonable doubt, and, and they have to be unanimous in this, then what would happen is the judge would sentence um, Brian, he would get life um, in the state of Idaho, the, uh, he would not be able to have any parole for the first 10 years of that. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the procedure if, uh, if it goes down that road. And then uh, right back to you, Tara, uh, how long on average uh, does it take to get through all the appeals before someone is put to death? I assume state to state is different. Texas is probably much quicker than other states. But do you have is there a rough idea? Let's say he was convicted and given the death penalty. Would it be five years, 10 years, 15 years? I mean, it, it, it could be a very, very long time, years and years. It could be over five years. I mean, it. it these appeals that are taken from death penalty cases, um, the post-conviction issues that are raised are intricate. They take a lot of time. Uh, there's a, a lot of factors that go into making the decision to even file those appeals. So uh, it, it would be years out. Uh, Sarah Zari, Mary, Mary Patterson, can the guest attorneys slash experts uh, address the Brian Koberger, victim's parents who filed the tort claim last week. Uh, so the Mogans and the Kobergers basically filed notice uh, against against the city of Moscow, University of Idaho, basically reserving the right to sue them down the road. Uh, can you explain what that means? I didn't know about that. Hmm. Um, a lawsuit hmm. for what? What relief? So they, they, they filed a motion. I'm trying to find it here in my hmm. notes. Um, basically notifying these entities. It was the city of Moscow, University of Idaho, and I want to say the Idaho State Police that they basically have, they're, they're reserving the right to file suit against them. Um, it was some sort of tort claim, but we don't have to go there. Uh, I just thought. Uh, I mean, I would be speculating. I mean, typically when you go after a university or a city or a municipality, um, you know, you're going after them for failing a duty, uh, potentially keeping the students, the residents safe. I just don't see the connection there, which is why I'm saying, is there some specific basis for this claim, this tort claim? Um, I'm just not aware of it. Yeah, it, it's it, it, it's basically, I guess, you know, uh, saying that there's liability, that the, the university didn't act properly to prevent this from happening. Um, I mean, listen, but if that is the case, Joel, uh, if that is really the claim, um, you have to be able to prove that the university knew, that the university knew that Koberger um, or others had been to this house that, 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 you know, that, that there were some steps that they could have taken to protect the residents of this home. I guess this is a university type housing, yeah. uh, that they failed that duty. And so that means that the university may have had notice about, you know, some sort of illicit, uh, trespassing or some, some, something that was posing a threat to them, uh, and that they failed their duty. Otherwise, I, I don't know how they could be liable uh, if somebody's lying in wait randomly, isolated incident at four in the morning, and then yeah. going into this home and committing a crime. And we had uh, Detective Phil Waters on, and he said that you basically have to know what you know now. Uh, Correct. You have to know prior, uh, and it right. doesn't. He yeah. hindsight it, is twenty twenty, right? So yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. And 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 Phil Waters, um, and, and I don't want to quote him, but basically said, you know, it's it's an attempt at trying to. You know, get some money for the families. He wasn't in favor of it, but um, it's part of the law, and I guess they might pursue that avenue. Um, mm -hmm. Kathleen, to you, Tara, uh, they want to throw you under the bus here. Why do you think that the Gonzalez family demands so much more attention in the media than the other victims' families? It's a little off-putting to me. Uh, that's something else that Detective Waters uh, spoke out about. Uh, he he feels like maybe Stephen Gonzalez was being too vocal. 
um, without getting you know, too controversial, do you have a thought about this one way or the other? If you were the attorney, let's say, for the Gonzaleses, would you tell them to lay low? Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that these families were deeply affected by the loss of their children and how they are reacting now, what they're doing. And we, we can't judge them harshly for that. Everyone reacts in a different way. They deal with grief in a different way especially in a circumstance where you feel like you may not have control. I mean, the criminal justice system is not known and doesn't have the reputation for being really kind to victims' families. I mean, in some ways, the process kind of re-victimizes families by having to go through it. And so, um, you know, it, it may be that this is the one thing they feel that they can control. You know, they're taking up arms. They're making sure that they're shining a light on what they believe is a, um, you know, awful crime and an injustice. And so, and this is the the realm of control that they have. So I, I guess I what I would say is it, while it may be off-putting to some people, I wouldn't be judging those families the rather the way that they're reacting now. I think we just have to keep in mind the deep trauma yeah. that they're experiencing as a result yeah. of it. I also think that families sometimes in these cases with multiple victims, it's sort of like having a jury for person, you know, they sort of rely on right. The, the one that's more vocal, that has mm -hmm. better resources or whatnot to advocate for all of them. And I saw that with the Gonsalveses, like when the, when the uh, murders initially occurred and everyone was like, what is going on? Who did this? Um, I was going on Cuomo's show on News Nation on a different topic. And uh, the sister of uh, Gonsalves, the victim, was on sort of reporting what happened. So from the very beginning, they've been the more active, um, you know, family uh of, of the four for sure um sarah adams says i think his standing silent Koberger is nothing more than his last chance to hang on to power control that's the way some people view it sarah zari i'm curious uh from a kind of a human and humane perspective um let's say hypothetically you are defending brian Koberger. um back to stephen gonzalez he was on cnn saying that he feels you know tremendous rage uh, he went on News Nation and says, you just can't hunt our babies. Uh, obviously, he's very upset. He's open about wanting the death penalty. If you're defending someone like Brian Koberger as uh, a defense attorney, how do you internally deal with these victims' families on the other side um, who are you know are hurting really badly? Um, how do you personally deal with that as a defense attorney? I mean, look, my job is really not personal. My job is to is about the process, you know, and whether my client is being treated um, lawfully by the government. If there's overreaching, I'm sort of the the watchdog <laughs> of that. That's how I take my job. But you have to be mindful. I mean, for, oh, look, first of all, I'm a human being, right? I mean, of course, I I feel for these families, you know, um, and. Uh, I'm also one of the more realistic attorneys where if I feel like my client is delusional and doesn't really get the gravity of what they've done, I make sure I nail it in their head. <laughs> like, yo, you know, you brutally stab four people. I mean, I, I literally have those conversations, you know, because sometimes you really have, I mean, you can't ignore that. You know, you can't ignore that. You would be very insensitive. Um, you certainly can't go into victim blaming and shaming and what they should have done and they didn't do or the, the fact that they were on drugs and drunk passed out. I mean, I would never go there, you know? And so the, 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 I think where it becomes challenging is where the clients lose sight of what really occurred. You know, these were four lives that were lost senselessly, like Tara said. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, listen, it's, it's, it's a, it's a constant tension between, the emotional and the human being side of me <laughs> and the, the job that I have to do, which is really, I have to set those aside to be able to be effective. And she's a very effective defense attorney. Andy School, breaking news, a friend of the show, on our show. Danny Masterson, the actor yeah, uh, in that 70s show, found guilty of raping two of three women. He is going to jail. I bet you will see Sarah Azari on News Nation talking about this. Later today, I won't be surprised if that happens. A couple more uh, quick things, and then we'll wind it up. Um, 
Tar, I think I asked you about this, so I'm going to go back to Sarah. So one of the revelations in this big Dateline episode that came out was that he purchased this, allegedly purchased this knife. This is according to a single source uh, that Dateline has, uh, that he purchased this K-Bar knife on Amazon uh, more than a year before the crimes and then drove with it across state lines from Pennsylvania to Washington State. Um, Dumb question, but how big a deal is this if it's true? I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities for the defense to disconnect the knife purchased a year or whatever plus before with, um, a, you know, it's not it's not some unique knife. I mean, it is the same type of knife that is used, but certainly there's a lot of arguments that could be made. Um, there were also wasn't there also evidence that a knife was returned on it. I mean, it was purchased, but then returned. I don't know if that's the same knife, but he certainly purchased some knife and then returned it. So again, I think um, um, what, what I believe is eventually going to be learned is that there were other people in this home at the, around the time of the murders. Um, whether they were involved or what their involvement or non-involvement might have been, I have no idea. Um, and I think to me, I keep going back to the question that Brian Koberger um, asked when they were arresting him. The one thing he said is, have you arrested anybody else? Mm -hmm. And that to me, I, I'm not being a profiler. I'm not trying to read into stuff like I'm trying to steer away from that. But there's some there's something to that statement. And it's not just, oh, go get somebody else. I'm trying to deflect from myself. I believe that there's there were other people there. I, I think it's fascinating because uh, I hear he purchased a knife in my head. I'm like guilty. But uh, you see a seasoned, <laughs> seasoned defense attorney and right away. Uh, there's a million reasons why it could have happened. Uh, Tara, um, you know, do you do you follow Sarah's logic or to you is that uh, evidence uh, of a hideous crime? This I won't be offended, Tara. You could say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I get it. I mean, I think Sarah is spot on on that issue. I mean, I, I think that um, there's certainly a lot that we still don't know. We still have apparently evidence out there that we haven't seen and and defense hasn't seen it. We certainly haven't seen it yet too. So I, I hesitate to, you know, jump in and, and speculate on that as well, because we just, we just don't know. And a good, a defense attorney is going to find those holes, you know, because it is the state's burden. They do have to connect all the dots here. And so, um, you know, I think it's, especially when you have a death penalty case, there is a lot at stake. And so mm -hmm. we've got to be careful and we have to be thoughtful about the ways that we're analyzing this evidence. By the way, so I just said I like the way Joel says Sarah. How do you say Sarah, Joel? I don't. I say Sarah. I don't know, but I oh, also it's have New York. It's a New York accent. Yeah, Sarah, it's New Jersey. That's Sarah. what it is. Sarah. I like it. Uh, I like it. Sarah. <laughs> uh, but I also have Tara on, and people think it's Tara, but I it's think you don't Tara. say Tara to her. But it's Tara, <laughs> Tara, Tara, but I say Sarah. How do you say? <laughs> how do you say it, Azari? Sarah, how do you say Sarah? Sarah. 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 I have That's a Jersey it. accent. Okay. I like it though. I do like it. I do like huh. it. Uh, all right. Well, it is what it is, I guess. Um, two more quick things. So um, back to you, Azari. Now I'm going to now I'm going to call you Azari instead of Sarah. Um, yes. He allegedly stalked this female classmate going so far as to um, kind of set up a camera. I uh, mean, he, 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 what, what, is that just, is that just all? That's what I'm talking about. That's, see, that's, that's what drives me crazy about this case. It's like, you know, no matter what this guy has he done to in his up. entire on. life, in his entire life, it has been nefarious. I mean, listen, I mean, he set up a camera and this girl's whatever. He, he could have been just a good college buddy or a friend or whatever. That doesn't mean he's now got this connection to be the peeping Tom. And I mean, that's that's what really frustrates me about this case is that while he may very well be like everything he's done in his life has had a nefarious reason. I also think it's just, we just don't know. We just don't know who he is. We really mm. don't. Me nine says Tara is amazing. Love, love, love. What is not to love about Tara Malik? Um, speaking of that. Ta I'm sorry. Tara, can I ask Tara a question? You sure can. What's your background, Tara? Malik is a Middle Eastern name now. Uh, it's my married last name. So oh. the husband's very American. My I'm Middle Eastern though. I'm uh, oh, yeah. Iranian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am too. Yep. 
Oh, you are? I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's, that's awesome. You got two homies on your podcast. We, we have and a new didn't even know it. Powerhouse team now. That's right. We're, we're very go. smart. We're very intuitive. Yeah. Yes, we are. You know, why it. we're good lawyers. No, I'm serious. Why we're good lawyers. We're kind of witchy. We're like, we have this intuition. <laughs> that's you know, that's really good. When you're cross-examining somebody, you best not just be listening to the words. You better mm -hmm. be like, really intuitive you know and mm -hmm. he got that i'm serious i'm serious. <laughs> i love it i know for sure you do not mess with middle eastern women you won't do that that's that's one thing i know for damn sure oh, name. Right, right. masterson could get 30 years here that's crazy and by the way i the first time i met you i asked you if you were related to rami malik right the guy who you did yes yeah, yeah, you, did. No, you did yeah no let me say there. something about masterson my good friend, Sean Holly was one of the defense lawyers with, I think, mm -hmm. Phil Cohen. And she's a wonderful lawyer. She used to be a public defender, then was um, recruited by Johnny Cochran to join the O.J. Simpson defense team. And it, it went on, you know, just went on on her own after that. But uh, I think they did a fantastic job. This jury was out deliber de uh, just deliberating for like, I don't know, two weeks or something. The jury was out for a long time. So I was shocked at this verdict because I really thought, that that long of a deliberation would be, you know, not guilty, but yeah, yeah, we'll they see. were out a long time. Uh, sentencing August eighth uh, on that case. Um, so the final thing that I wanted to cover because this is kind of a red herring and a gift, Sarah Azari, to uh, a defense attorney potentially. There's this other story uh, that was on Dateline, but I think we heard bits and pieces of it before, where prior to Brian Koberger's arrival in. Idaho or Washington State when he was still in Pennsylvania this college student calls the police it's on body cam footage says that she had a suitcase with her clothing uh, a pair of underwear was removed everything was moved around and the underwear was stuffed on the passenger side of the vehicle um, kind of weird odd uh, behavior of course um, if you're a defense attorney are you latching on to that like a piranha and uh say look there, did you, i didn't yeah. follow that the suitcase was found in Coburger's car no 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 so so there was um about a, a more than a year before brian was mm -hmm. either in washington state or when he was still back in pennsylvania yeah. a young woman who is a student calls police she says i had this she had this roller bag i uh, got back from a little weekend away i noticed that all my clothes were taken out moved around and whoever did this put my underwear on the passenger side, whatever that is, the little sl slot. What's the connection um, of that to Coburger, though? Uh, no, I'm saying there is no connection because he wasn't there. My point yeah. is, if you're, if you're a defense attorney, are you going to say there's some other twisted pervert in this area moving around women's panties? Uh, and stalking them. And stalking them, yes. Yeah. So is that something that plays into the hands of the defense? Yeah, 100%. I think, I mean, I think that, I don't know, Tara might be coming up with something more creative than me, but I think the idea is that there's some other weirdo in the, in the hood and that it's that guy. I mean, a lot of what you want to do is it's, you don't necessarily have to point to the guy, you want to point to another guy, you know? And so that really gives you fodder for that, right? Um, someone else is, is doing these weird things and they're stalking. And this is exactly how stalking starts. It's a behavior that escalates. It goes from this underwear and moving things around to then more serious things, entering the home with a knife, et cetera. So I think that's exactly, I mean, any, anything like that, the defense is going to point the finger to mm. if he goes to trial. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tali from Israel asking another tough question, and we'll start to wrap it up. Uh, for you, Tara, uh, what approach would you take, and then we can get Sarah's perspective on this too, in cross-examining the surviving roommates? Um, that is obviously a tenuous ground because you're doing this in front of jurors. Um, these are victims, but uh, how would you approach something like this? Well, you know, it depends on which which individuals we're talking about cross-examining. So one of the things you want to go in is, you know, we had a roommate who uh, poked her head out and saw Koberger allegedly down the hall. Well, I would want to know from her, you know, how far away from, you know, from this person were you? You didn't actually see their face, did you? You just saw, you know, an eyebrow or eyebrows or so you are really going after um, and 
and not really going after. And you can certainly do it in a delicate way that, you know, yeah. takes into consideration that obvious trauma that I'm sure they're experiencing. But you want to ask what the basis of their knowledge is. And so that's what you're going after. What did you see? What did you sense? You know, what did you hear? And then you're going to go and say, OK, but what did you actually see? You know, how much of it is you speculating that it was this person? What did you not see? What did you not hear? Were you, you know, had you been out partying the night before? Were you drinking the night before? Because that can affect your perception as well. So those are the types of questions that I would be really focused on is if, if the reason the state is putting on uh, an individual, first of all, you want to figure out what they're trying to get, what they're trying to establish with each witness. And yeah. then you're coming in as the defense attorney and you're going, OK, if they're trying to establish this point, what takes away from that point? Right. And if it's uh, it was Koberger and he looked like Koberger, then I'm going to go after, OK, were you seeing things clearly? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, the idea of dismantling, um, figuring out where what their point is and then dismantling that point. And the other thing, too, with that particular witness that Tara brought up, I may not be as kind when I get to her inconsistent statements. Mm -hmm. She apparently mm -hmm. made multiple statements and they were very different from one another. And that, to me, is a perfect opportunity, nicely but effectively, to kind of discredit her altogether. And also, what about the food that you ordered? You know, what happened to that guy? Where was he? What did he see? I mean, you know, no one's talking about that guy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to know where my freaking food is at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, hey, I'm ordering food at 4 a.m. So, <laughs> you know, why is nobody talking about that guy? Where is he? Has he been talked to? Has he been interviewed? I would grill her on that, all of that. So uh, it, it is it is tough because you're dealing, like Tara said, with traumatized victims. Um, you know, I, I think that depending on what comes out on the delay of eight hours before she called, I may be careful not to really go hard on her um, waiting that long. But then when it gets to making, you know, inconsistent, I mean, that's what you do. You got to impeach their credibility. So you can't just, you know, you can't take a beat on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lou LaMarocco, Sarah, responded to someone in the chat. The overwhelming amount of evidence points directly to the suspect, not a number of people. That is true. There is a tremendous amount of uh, yeah. of evidence. And then the best comment of the day, Persian women from Frankie Fitz. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Barb Malik, she is an Idaho licensed attorney practicing in state and federal court in business and commercial litigation. Uh, she has experience in both civil and criminal law. She... Uh, ran for uh, state office and might get back into that political ring. A uh, big thank you, by the way, to Dave Ehrenberg, the Florida state attorney out of Palm Beach County. Love having him on. Um, you know how he is, Sarah Zari. He's, he's a big, as they say in uh, Yiddish, a big mocker. He's got things to do. So uh, I, always, yeah. I get nervous. Keeping I don't him know on. how he does it. I don't know how he does it. He's, he's always he's, on something. Yeah, he's always on something all day long. Um Tara, thank you for coming. Uh, your final thoughts on this question here from Lex Luther: Whether innocent or guilty, uh, Koberger, that is, would Ann Taylor take on this huge case? Had BK as a client, had he thought she couldn't put up a strong defense? I've heard great things about her. Uh, response to this and your final thoughts. You know, she she is a great attorney. She knows exactly what she's doing. I, I certainly we have a you know a strong bar, but a small bar in uh, the state of Idaho. Uh, there's only a certain amount of individuals in, in the northern Idaho area where Moscow is that are death penalty certified. I think um, she is going to do the best she can with this case. And I don't think it's about um, whether or not she can put up a strong defense. It's getting the right outcome for this particular client. So, yeah, I think she she would take it on no matter what. Um, Sarah Zari, uh, if you don't know her, you you should and you will and she'll be on uh news nation tonight i'm sure she is a high profile criminal defense attorney based in la decades of experience in all kinds of complex felonies she is a tough woman tough legal mind and is known as she says for her unfiltered unbiased and informative uh legal point of view uh let's end with something that i know sarah will have fun with a uh, patriot lady, just about every intuitive or psychic on YouTube says that BK has had one or two other people working him with him, two to three total. Um, have you ever called in a psychic on a case, Sarah Azari? 
No, I told you I'm kind of witchy myself. I mean, I told you I, I'm kind of. <laughs> now, hey, Sarah Zari is down kidding. with this. I'm kidding. Um, I have not. I have not. I stick to science and facts and, you know, my experience. Um, but again, I, I assuming that Koberger is the guy, I don't believe he's the only guy. That's just my guess. I believe there's a lot more going on in that house that we know about. Interesting. Interesting. And will that all come out in the trial, do you believe? Yeah. I mean, I think if there's a trial, I think that there are a number of people that were there that may, even the ones that, uh, well, there are deceased individuals, but the one that uh, Tara mentioned, and then there was one other survivor, I believe. Um, and there may be other people that weren't there when the police responded that may have been there the night before. It's a party house, apparently, you know, and so, you know, who was there when they left? What was going on? Uh, all of that matters. I, I just don't think it's that Koberger just snuck in and did this and just walked out and him and the occupants were the only ones there. Mm. June says, I cannot imagine going through what these families have endured. I can't judge how any of them process and react to their situation. Let them process it the way they see fit to do. Followed by Shivani countering Sarah Azari here by saying, I think Koberger acted alone. Followed by Donna, who says, I didn't think I could love you even more, Sarah Azari. So there you <laughs> Thank go. Thank you, Donna. Love you, too. <laughs> there you go. A quick programming note. If you thought this panel was awesome, uh, tomorrow night's panel is awesome, too. We've got... The legend, Dr. Ann Burgess, coming on uh, the show, Netflix Mindhunter, uh, is loosely based on her original work. And there is a new docuseries being made about her. She testified on behalf of the defense in the original Menendez uh, trials, uh, I believe, for Eric. And then Dr. John Conte uh, was Lyle's social worker, spent, uh, I think, over 100 hours with him. He also testified as a defense witness. They will both be on tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, original witnesses, and right back here, 5 p.m. Eastern, Friday with Great Scott, it's your true crime Phil, with Detective Bill Waters and Scott Duffy. Until then, love you, America. Love you, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Love you, Los Angeles. And uh, love you everywhere in between. Till next time. Thanks, Joel.